A man whose face conveyed a merit of emotions, whose enigmatic fedora captivated the entire nation, despite his shadow fading from the Texas sidelines four generations ago. Tales of his heroic deeds still resonates far and wide. If you're concentrating, you're not smiling a whole lot. I enjoy smiling, but I don't enjoy it on the sideline. I'm all business. When someone once asked how to describe Tom Landry in a word, they simply proclaimed class. See, uh, on us off that we can't win the big one anymore. That's, that's I would think so. Well, if it is, I don't know how you spell it. Landry's guiding principles and unwavering morals not only shaped an entire generation, but also defined the reputation of America's team. Landry's reign witnessed the transition of seven presidents. And I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States, so help me God. Outlasting the Vietnam War. But you've seen how it really was. Heroism, danger, fear, all rolled into one. And bearing witness to both the tragic assassinations and the rise of influential figures. Two priests who were with President Kennedy say he is dead. A sniper's bullet cut down Dr. King as he stood on a... ...created by the 3,000 teenagers on hand to greet... That's it! It's all over! The ups and downs. I can't get no relief. The Boston Celtics are the NBA world champion. First award honors the new kid on the block. Short to the hook! King of the air score! In a career that crossed the eras of rock, disco, and hip-hop, his coaching tenure of 29 years ultimately garnered unparalleled success. Thank you, Coach. Thank you. It's very nice. Congratulations. Yet, the pinnacle of achievement was not always within reach. Mr. Doyle, no, was the teacher in the school giving a lesson one afternoon. The Landry family originated from modest origins. Landry's paternal grandfather hailed from Canada and was the descendant of French immigrants. Settling in Illinois during the 1800s, the Landry clan established their roots. In 1883, Alfred Landry, Tom Landry's grandfather, married his grandmother Lillian Anderson. The Landry family flourished, raising six children, although tragedy struck when two of their offspring perished during severe winter storms in Illinois during the early 19th century. Ray Landry, Tom Landry's father, endured the hardships of rheumatism. The family doctor advised that the Landrys relocate to a warmer climate for race treatment. The Landry family packed their belongings and migrated to Mission, Texas, nestled in the Rio Grande Valley, a small town inhabited by merely three to 5,000 residents. Mission became their new home. The change of environment proved beneficial as the once feeble Ray Landry blossomed in his teenage years into a local sports prodigy, achieving local success as both a baseball and football player. The Ray and Ruth Landry tied the night in 1920, and by 1924, they welcomed three children into the world, including their newborn baby boy, Tom Landry, born on September 11th of that summer. Though stoic and self-assured as a man, a young Landry grappled with a lisp and battled with insecurities during his childhood. Furthermore, he had several close brushes with death. One particular day at the age of six, Landry was riding his brother's bike along the dirt roads next to the irrigation canal. Unfortunately, he paddled too quickly and collided with a road bank. The impact resulted in Landry being thrown off his bike and landing in a bushy cactus, with his backside taking the brunt of the fall. In pain and discomfort, Landry hurried home with the cactus needles embedded in his backside. Though the physical pain he experienced was overshadowed by the embarrassment he felt, an already shy Landry found himself in a vulnerable position, lying on a table with his backside exposed as his mother and friends removed the needles. This incident further contributed to his already insecure personality. Among Landry's cherished childhood memories was fishing on the Rio Grande with his grandfather and Uncle Arthur. However, what could have been a pleasant excursion turned into a near tragedy. I'd say the Lord has blessed us all today. It's just that he's been particularly good to me. Uncle Arthur entrusted Landry with carrying the fish as they made their way back home. In his excitement, Landry lost his balance and ended up falling into the canal. A young Landry found himself submerged in the water. Suddenly, his Uncle Arrow reached into the waters and grabbed Landry by the head and pulled him to shore. This incident was revelatory for Landry because despite of imminent peril, he still held on to the fish. It was a testament 
to Landry's stoic nature, which would become a defining characteristic in his later life. The Landry family had a passion for deer hunting. Every week, his father and uncle Arthur went out to hunt, and young Tom Landry relished hearing about their hunting adventures. Often, he would wait outside his grandmother's house for their return. On one occasion, Landry eagerly spotted their car parked across the street. Without hesitation, he darted towards it, unaware of an oncoming car down the street. Tragically, Landry was struck by the car, narrowly escaping death but suffering a broken leg. His recovery required wearing a leg brace for nearly a year. Despite these near-death experiences, living in Mission, Texas provided him with an overall wonderful childhood experience. As a small town, everyone knew each other. Ironically, the same canal where Landry had nearly lost his life was also a gathering spot where he and his friends learned how to swim. It was during the hot summers when Landry and his barefoot friends would ride their bicycles down to the local swimming pool, Crystal Waters, to improve their swimming skills. Landry became proficient in swimming and diving. They would often take a hike up the irrigation canal to go fishing. Or, as they grew older, they went deer hunting. Landry and his best friend, Wade Spillman, earned money by caddying at the golf course for 25 cents. In the 1930s, 25 cents was a significant amount of money for a child. An ice cream cone cost only three cents, and candy was just one cent. Give the child a $20 bill, Mr. Brownwell. Yes, sir. Uh, give her a piece of candy, Mr. Brownwell. Yes, sir. Pay attention to things, Mr. Brownwell. Yes, sir. When Landry needed more money, he would sell newspapers on the streets. On Saturday mornings, Landry and his friends would go to the theater to watch Saturday morning TV shows for five cents. His favorite shows were The Lone Ranger and Tarzan. They would also visit a local theater before sunset to watch movies, mainly cowboy flicks. Ray was a local hero who used his athleticism in baseball and football to win the hearts of residents all over Mission, Texas. Ray was a mechanic by trade and willingly served as the leader of a volunteer fire department. During the 1920s and early 1930s, the Great Depression hit America and caused an economic shock across the country. With Secretary of the Treasury Wooden, the president orders every bank in the nation to close. Welcome home. Even Little Mission, Texas, was not exempt from its impact. Landry's mother spent $1.50 per day to provide meals for an entire family. Ruth often opened her back door to distribute dinners to needy families. Ray Landry offered his fire department for free to young men who needed a temporary place to stay and a hot meal. During the 1930s, professional football was not a well-known sport in Landry's town. But the Yankees were a different story. The popularity of the Yankees reached even into the valley and beyond the river banks. The only way Landry could listen to the games was with an African-American shoe shiner outside the local barbershop. Young Landry listened attentively as the great Bambino revolutionized baseball. The Yankees are hard hitting quartet, Lou Gehrig, Combs, Lazari, and Babe Ruth. And he heard the wooden bat of the Yankee Clipper hit 29 home runs as a rookie. In 1936. Yet, his dedication was always to football. Landry, from the sunset over the valley until the dust of Sandlot football brushed against the streetlights, Landry and his friends would engage in spirited football matches, arguing, fighting, and competing, running tirelessly into the night. It was in various locations such as a vacant lot, the backyard, or even on the sidewalk, that Landry experienced the invaluable lessons of victories and defeats. His thirst for these experiences seemed insatiable. Despite his natural timidity and occasional self-doubt, Landry developed confidence and a sense of self-worth. By the time Landry reached the ninth grade, professional football had gained increasing popularity, notably enhanced by the contributions of Don Hudson. Here's Don Hudson, once the pride of Alabama, one of the fastest men in pro football. The Alabama Antelope. On the hands of Hudson, he revolutionized the passing game, made quarterbacks and wide receivers glaring positions, and helped elevate the league's reach across the country. In his freshman year, Landry mistakenly volunteered to play center, an action orchestrated by his coach Bob Morton. 
It is noteworthy that Martin, who was of Mexican descent, held the position of junior varsity coach at Mission High, an uncommon occurrence in the racially segregated South of the 1930s. Martin emerged as the most inspirational figure in Landry's life. By the time Landry reached his junior year, the scrawny center harbored aspirations of becoming a quarterback. His father hung a used tire in the front yard to serve as a target for Landry's passes. Over the next few months, Landry's physical stature and strength improved by throwing hundreds of passes through rusty tire schemes. Landry saw a noticeable increase in both power and accuracy with each flick. Bob Martin, who lived two doors down, observed Landry's transformation into a formidable quarterback from his garage. Impressed by his progress, Martin made Landry the starting quarterback for the season. Once Landry became the 11th grade varsity quarterback, everything changed for him, particularly in terms of popularity. However, being the center of attention was not something Landry enjoyed. Nevertheless, he had no choice but to accept the role as the leader of the district's best football program. Despite his previous struggles with a lisp and difficulties with music and dancing, this brought about challenges. Hey, Jerry, there's that new girl in our math class. Oh, yes. Her name's Carolyn Ames. Such as having to kiss a popular girl on stage in front of the entire school, which left Landry feeling incredibly embarrassed. Landry spent most of his time with his teammates and friends, not giving much attention to his love life. Although he was voted as the cutest boy in school, Landry didn't appreciate the title as he felt it wasn't masculine enough. Despite his social disparity, Landry excelled in athletics. He played in almost every sport in Mission, Texas. He was a talented baseball player, but an even better basketball player. Yet, his passion for football was unmatched. In his varsity season, Landry exhibited great determination by giving up soda, adopting a healthy diet, and striving to surpass his previous achievements. The spirit of the season and the camaraderie among the players were palpable, leading everyone in Mission, Texas to believe that this year was destined for greatness. And indeed, it was. In 1941, at a time when the world was on the brink of another devastating war, a glimmer of hope emerged in the small town of Mission, Texas, embodied by a shy teenager with exceptional talent. Landry's performance during that season placed him among the greatest in Mission High's history. The bashful teenager was fiercely competitive, even playing through a broken face and leading his team to two scoring drives before being forced out by Coach Martin. Under Landry's leadership, the team achieved a flawless 12-0 record. In the game preceding the regional championship, Landry achieved a remarkable 76-yard touchdown, one of his three rushing scores on the ground. The Eagles performed exceptionally, securing a 19-0 victory. Unfortunately, their celebration was short-lived, as just two days later on December 7th, the Japanese launched a devastating attack on Pearl Harbor. A date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Ultimately plunging America into the throes of World War II, Landry and his close childhood companions, the very same individuals with whom he played Sandlot football on those dusty summer nights, participated in the regional championship, which would mark their final collective endeavor. It served as a fitting conclusion, the perfect ending of an intriguing journey that was filled with heartache, good times, and the best of times. Landry and his Eagles soared high as they convincingly beat Hondo 33 to nothing for the regional championship. Landry scored three touchdowns, including a 65-yard run, though Landry would ride with the steers after high school. Here are the Longhorns. He traveled the heavens in World War II. Join me next time as we continue Landry's remarkable journey to the pros. Until next time, don't forget to like and subscribe. And as always, thanks for watching.